Do you want me to tweet anything out or anything? Sure, go for it. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, as you know, my name's Jen. I'm a community manager here. And today, we are talking with Kirby Ferguson. And he is going to talk to us all about how to become an independent animator. And like, Kirby has was an employee. He was working a full-time job, 9 to 5, right? And then... Yes. Uh, all of a sudden, he made the switch to becoming an independent artist, and I'm sure that's really scary for a lot of us, And but something that we all uh, dream about doing one day is being your own boss and your own independent person and artist. So um, I just wanted to say that feel free to ask us your questions. I've enabled the question and answer app here on the side, so as you're watching this, you can go ahead and just ask questions and I'm going to field them for Kirby for you guys. Um, uh, and just keep in mind that the live stream is at least three minutes behind. So uh, there might be a slight delay in us answering your questions or like we might already answer a question that you ask because we're like a little bit delayed. Um, so that being said, Kirby, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself. Like how what was the first job that you've ever had? God, first first job, I, I drove a miniature train at an amusement park. That was my first job. Was, it, I was, like, was it too small for you to actually fit inside? No, I could. No, it wasn't that small. I, I could fit inside it, but it was like child-sized. So I was, and I was 16 at the time, so I, I was sort of, you know, scrunched up you in, in a miniature train. Now? I think that's a pretty cool first job to have, actually. What was your favorite part about that job? Uh, when it broke down, I'm being sarcastic now. It used to break down all the time. This this train, it was like an old clunk. It, it it was basically this amusement park that had kind of gone to seed, you know, like it wasn't what it used to be, mm -hmm. and uh, all the all the equipment was old, and this train would break down all the time. And one time it broke down with a train full of kids who had Down syndrome, wow. and it broke down in the tunnel, and I had to get all these kids out of this. This this story is not as funny as I was. <laughs> <laughs> so I was hoping it would be, but uh, it, there wasn't there wasn't a favorite part really. There were there were plenty of unfavorite parts, I think. So that right. was the very that was the very that, first job. I would say that would be a very interesting. Mine mine was waitressing. Woo. Yeah, that's it's mine's super miniature train is much more interesting than that. That, that is, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah I got so to beat. So, what would you say your first um, like nine to five career professional job. job would be? My first career job, I was a graphic designer. I used to work. Um, not really graphic designer, more like pre-production for printing. So this was still, this was before the web, and um, I used to prep things basically to print. So I used to get materials ready to go to uh, be output in, in some sort of way, either to film or, or, or directly output. Um, so it was really technical, like geeky kind of work. wasn't really creative, but I did have to know my way, like around the programs. I had to be able to go into the art and and figure out what was going and all going on and all that stuff. So it was it was technical work in a creative-ish field, um, but not creative work. So that that was how I started out. I started out as kind of a technician in graphic arts, and then from there, never totally got out of the technical end of it. Just because um, I wasn't that interested in, in graphic design, really. I, I had an interest in it when I was in university because mm -hmm. I wrote. Um, and I was, I was working with a student newspaper, and graphic design was this you know, really interesting field because it was a way for me to communicate with people. Like you could, you could design a newspaper, and you could, it could you know, be part of the, the way that you're communicating with people. So that was really interesting to me. But once it became advertising um, and it's just about you know pizza or, or whatever, then it, it got really boring. But I did it for quite a while because I didn't know what else to do. And, and I stayed in the field for 10 years, 15 years, a long time. In the graphic design field? Graphic design, yeah. Mostly doing, doing some creative work, but mostly doing um, more of kind of a technician, that more, more of kind of a technical worker. Um, I stayed in that for for a long, long time, just because the money was good, it was comfortable, it, it gave me time to do other things. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't horrible or anything, but not pretty boring, basically pretty boring. Ooh. And then made the switch to video production when I was 
that this was maybe six years ago or so, I started fooling around with video production in my spare time because, you know, with these design jobs, I had a reasonable amount of flexibility. That was a good good perk of the kind of freelance stuff I was doing. Um, so I could play around with, you know, once, once digital video came along and you could edit video on your computer and do all the stuff on your own, you could get good results, it didn't look, you know, chintzy. Uh, I got into that, and that was like a new, interesting way for for me to to tell stories. And I just jumped in and started making stupid, funny videos. And you know, got to be a good enough craftsman that I got a job in video production. And when I was doing that job, uh, I started a series called Everything Is a Remix on the side. Mm-hmm. And it was like uh, quite successful right off the bat. Like a lot of people saw it. It did way. It got way more attention than I ever anticipated it would. So I did another episode of it while I was still at this job. And then after that came out, I was like, okay, like I think because things were coming my way, like video commissions were coming my way, speaking engagements were coming my way. There was stuff that was coming to me. There, there was you know revenue coming to me. Uh, I realized like I think if, if I had more time for this, I could make a go of it. I could make a living at this. So I quit the job, and I've been an independent filmmaker doing my own things for five years, six years now. So okay. it's been long enough that I, I think I'm, I, 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 I've survived past the point where a lot of people would have died already, I think. So um, died, I, I, think, I think I've learned, I think I've learned some few things. I've learned a few things. Sorry, what did you say? But I, I wouldn't say died. That's a little bit extreme. But like maybe have Packed not sustained yourself. Retired. Yeah. yeah. Um, it so feels like death. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I agree there. Yeah, um, I have a quick question. So you said, so you were in the graphic design field for a while, and then all of a sudden you switched to video production. Like what, um, what prompted that switch? And I like think why, did, why video yeah. production? Because you could tell stories. I think video production, for, for me, for what the work was that was avail- available that you could get paid for, that was more about telling stories. Graphic design tended to be out at, about advertising. It was almost always just doing ads for, for publications or little pamphlets or whatever. It was almost entirely corporate work. And video production frequently was corporate, but at least there was some sort of storytelling element to it. So it was just much more interesting to me. And because I was good technically and I was a good, a solid designer at that point, um, it, it kind of helped me make the transition to being a good at a good video editor. Like some of those skills are, are transferable. And you know, within within a few years, I, I think I was I was pretty solid. I was a pretty solid video editor. So there actually are some some skills that that transfer between graphic design and 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 video editing. No, I totally know because I did. It's funny, did I kind of did both. Yeah, I went to school for graphic design, and I also yep. know how to video edit. Um, I actually started here in Federator as a graphic designer, and then uh, up my my management and I realized that I like talking and I like talking to people, and they're like, "You'd yep. be really good for community management." So. They moved me out of graphic design, and now I'm doing community management and talking all to you guys. So it's cool. I, I enjoy it a lot. It's not really a technical field, and I'm not an independent artist, but it's yeah. kind of... You learn a lot about communication part. doing graphic design. Like, you learn how to be concise. You learn how to tell stories. You learn, learn how to be clear. Right. It, it's a good craft to have. You learn how to talk to clients. Yes. <laughs> That's a major yes. component is yes. talking and, with, and dealing with people that yep. maybe you don't want to deal with, but you have to. For sure. Um... Cool. So, like, what prompted everything as a remix? Like, because you were you were doing video editing, and then you just were doing everything uh, as a remix on the side. Was it just like a pet project that you wanted to do, and it kind of exploded, or like, how did that mm-hmm. come about? It was it, it was that it was a pet project that that exploded. Basically, it was something that. Uh... I don't know where it came from originally. I, I think originally I thought it would be in the series. I have these segments about um, about Star Wars and about the Mac and about Led Zeppelin, and there's sort of these breakdowns of like how um, how things got how creative work gets done basically. And I thought originally that I'd probably just do a series maybe of of unrelated videos, short videos that would just be about those particular things. But then I realized that you know there's a larger story here that I that I think I could tell like a larger point that I could make I could kind of weave it into to something bigger and divide it up into parts which appealed to me because I was doing short form stuff at the time um, so it just sort of emerged I'm not exactly sure where it came from it emerged out of the the 
direction that I was heading. I didn't anticipate. I, I thought it could have good appeal, but I didn't expect it to be. I had no clue that it, that it would do as, as well as it did. And I went after it just because I was interested. Like, I was interested in, in that story. I wanted to tell that story. I wanted to figure out how it ended. I didn't know how it would end when I started it. Like, I didn't quite know how I would, how I would make the argument that I was going to make. And I had to figure it all out. But I was interested in that, and that's what you know kept me going, kept me going through it. So, for those of us watching that don't know everything is a remix, one, can you explain really quickly sure. what yeah. the show is, and two, where yeah. can they watch it? Everything is a remix is a, a free four-part video series that you can watch on the web. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find it, or if you go to everythingisremix.info, you, you can see it there. And it's basically a series that kind of draws an analogy between remixing, between taking existing stuff and existing songs, for instance, and making new songs out of the old songs. And the new songs are, you know, it's clearly new music, but it's also clearly made of, of old songs. Basically, I, I use that as an, anal as an analogy for any sort of creative work. I think that's how we do creative work. We copy things, we transform them, we combine them. And there's a, I'm not meaning to demean um, creative work because there's an incredible amount of work. There's a lot of sweat and hard labor that goes into it. But the basic, the basic things, I think, are things that anybody can do. And I think, you know, starting with emulating people is a really good place to start. It tends to be really frowned upon. But I think, you know, starting with copying other people's stuff is a, is a really great way to, to get going. And then once you start transforming that material and combining it with other things that you've got, then you know eventually you can end up kind of developing your own voice and your own uh, vision that really doesn't resemble anybody else at that point because it's just so complex and, and, and it's so multi-layered at that point that you can't really tell where it came from anymore. But I think that's where I think that's where creative work comes from. It comes from you know comes from the world around us, from our history, from our personal experiences. You know, it, it's not magical. Awesome. So where can we watch it? At everythingisremix.info you can find it. It's on Vimeo and YouTube as well. It's, it's not hard to find. Awesome. Perfect. So everyone, I will post a link um, cool. in the description once this video goes live afterwards. By the way, for anyone watching, you can watch this video um, afterwards live if you miss the beginning or anything like that on our YouTube channel, Channel Thread Network um, on YouTube. So... Uh, Kirby, what was like the turning point for you when you realized like so you had you had your full time job, you were doing everything as a remix on the side. Like was there was there like an earnings threshold? What mm -hmm. what was the point where you're like, you know what, I'm gonna do this full time? Gosh, that's a good question. I don't I, I sorry. Uh, I don't think that there was one. I don't think there was like a specific tipping point. Um, but there was the slow kind of realization that if I put more time towards it, if I freed up more resources that I could get more out of it. And I think I did put a cap on basically how much I would go into debt. I think it was financed by debt originally. And I think it was 10 grand. I think I was willing to just absorb 10 grand in debt to, uh, to see what would happen. And uh, I think... I, I, I'm sorry, I don't really remember, but I think that's how it started. I think I had, so I did have a hard number in mind, and I think it was $10,000. It was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for this, and I'm going to absorb ten grand, which you know, I, I was going to do uh, regardless of how well, well it did. I probably was going to you know, in, incur that kind of debt just because it needs to, needs to get rolling. Um, so that was how it started for me. Basically, it was sort of a slow dawning that I, I, could, I could make a living at this that I thought I could potentially. You're never going to know, too, right? Like, I thought I could. I had a hunch. And then I set a, I set a burn limit, like, how far am I willing to, to go with this? And I do think that's important. I think that's important for young artists. Like, you don't want to just get credit card after credit card and just, like, double down, double down, double down, and just, you know, keep gambling and, and throwing good money after bad. Like, I think you want to put a hard limit on it and say, like, I'm, I'm going to go for it for six months or for this amount of money or whatever uh, and then at that point you know you, you have to you have to deal with reality you have to deal with financial reality at that point and it, it either works or it doesn't right what um, how scary was it to take that leap of faith to be like well I'm gonna be ten because if it's not if it doesn't work out you're ten thousand dollars in debt and now you have to climb your way back up or were you confident that like, hey I can get another job it's not a big deal like was it was it frightening to quit your job and go 
full time and everything's a remix? Yeah, I think stressful is more the word I would choose than than frightening. I, I think I was reasonably confident about it. I, I thought I could make it work. It was just a matter of how I, I could make it work because I had something that was was very successful. It it did really well, and I thought there's got to be some way. Like like, how much more do you need to be successful? Like I've got something that you know hundreds of thousands of people are are really into. Uh, surely you can. I, I, there's some way that I can I can make this work. So it was more a matter of how I could make it work, and it was plenty stressful. It, it never stops being stressful, actually. It, it is a stressful life uh, when you're on your own. When you're in a team, when you've got a job that, that's the least stressful, um, although that's a bit of an illusion. You can lose your job at any point. And when you are on a team, you get to, you get to distribute the, the stress a bit. You know, It gets to be shared among the group when you're on your own. Uh, it's all yours. The stress is all yours. So it was stressful then, and, and honestly, it's it's still stressful. It's a very, for most independent artists, it's a, it's a very uh, edgy kind of existence. Like you're 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 probably not going to you're not going to get rich probably unless you get really lucky or even wealthy. You're just you know you're hoping to stay at like the level that you would be if you had a job. I think. And it, it's it's it can get tense. At times, you know, you want to definitely build up a buffer so that you can be okay for a few months if things dry up or whatever. But it is, uh, it is stressful because it's all on you. You got to figure it out when, uh, when it's not working. There's no paid vacation days. Nope, <laughs> not. <laughs> right. But thankfully, when you like what you're doing, vacation doesn't matter as much. Exactly. It's not really a job, just a way of life yeah. and sustaining yourself. And speaking of sustaining yourself, like how. Like, because you've been doing this now for six years, which is incredible and it's awesome. Like, what, what, what can you attribute that to? Like, how do you feel? Like, well, I was able to stay afloat because I did this every day, or like, what, yeah. what do you think? How do you think you're being so successful with it for six years? I think for me, it was about everybody's different. I mean, everybody should should figure it out for themselves. I think you have to pay attention to what's coming at you from from the work. Um, what is the feedback from from what you're doing? And for me, I realized that, hey, people want me to do talks. I, I can make money doing talks. Um, that was actually a really good uh, income source for, for the couple of years when the series was really at its prime. That kind of kept me afloat, I think. And then people want me to make videos that are kind of like the video I'm making. So when you put something out there for free, that that's a real, um, that's really good for your perspective work because then you're putting something out there that's like I like this and I'm putting this out there and then people are like hey I like that too I want something that's you know kind of like that um, so at least you're putting something out there that you like you know it's not like when you're working a job and you have to make it like you know like your boss wants it or whatever and you can't really do things the way that you would like to see them done um, so for me it was just it was getting something out there that I thought there was that that there turned out to be interest in I think that's a big deal. Get it out there. See that you know people care about this thing, and then pay attention to what comes your way. And for me, the realization was I could make money on video commissions, and I could do talks. And there, there's a smattering of, of other things as well. There was merchandise. There was um, you know donations. Like experiment, try different things. Pay attention to what the results are, and scale up if you can on on the things that work. But I think building an audience is the is the first. You know, that, that's the fundamental. If you don't have that, then if you don't have an audience, then you don't have a platform. Right. So, I mean, you were lucky where your series got a lot of attention right from the start, but there is still, I'm assuming that you still had to go out there and advertise yourself and promote yourself and build your audience. Not really. Right. Believe, believe no? it or not, not really. Uh, um, I did. There, there was a re yeah. It, it was fortunate. There was a reasonable amount of marketing. Like I know people at this point. I'd been making videos. I'd been making other videos that were you know decently successful for a while. So I knew some people. I, I know how to get in touch with people and, and let them know in a concise way what I'm up to. I, I know a fair amount about the web and where to go and what's going on. So there was a, a decent amount. But the truth is, by part three of the series, it was just doing its own thing, and it didn't seem like it mattered much whether I was pushing it or not. It was just it was just going at that point. Um, there wasn't much to do, so that that's a very fortunate thing that can happen once you get something that snowballs and is is rolling down the hill. It just kind of it just keeps going. So I was I was in a, a lucky spot for for a bit. 
Well, what about now? Do you like run your own Facebook, Twitter, yeah. anything like that? I do all that stuff, but mainly for for me, see, things have shifted. Like around when the series was at its prime, there was a lot of interest in speaking engagements. Now there's less of that, so I had to make that money up some other way. So now it's about doing video commissions. So for video commissions, I have to like stay in touch with with clients I've worked with in the past, or like put the word out there and do some meetings here and there and. Uh, I, I do have to to go get that work uh, for sure. And and how do you do that? Like, how do you keep in touch with everyone? Primarily, is it just email or yeah. like if if you have to reach out and be like, hey, I'm open for video commissions. Like, how yeah. do you do that? It's mostly it, it, I, it's people. I keep in touch with people that I've worked with in the past. Um, that's mostly what it has been. Like, there are people that I worked with back when. Everything is remix was really rolling, and then I'll, I'll just let them know, like, hey, I have this opening coming up whenever, and if you have something going on, let me know. And um, you know, sometimes you, you you get fortunate with with that. So I, for me, it's about staying in touch with people that I've worked with in the past, um, and then also just staying active. I have a new series that I do called "This Is Not a Conspiracy Theory," which is a commercial series. But it still has, you know, so it's not out. It's not the publicity piece that everything is remix was because it's not just floating around out there free. But it still generates interest. Like people see what I'm doing, and I occasionally get, you know, interest in in work from them. So I think for me, the main thing is putting putting work out there and and getting attention with with, with what you're doing. So when you when you were doing, because you did a lot of talks with, uh, you did TED talks, you did South mm-hmm. by Southwest. Um, what kind of things would you talk about? Everything is Remix. I would do basically a... So Everything is Remix, the series is like... A, it's about 40 minutes long, the whole thing, and I would do... Uh, talks tend to be 45 minutes long. That, that's mostly what people want. They want 45 minutes, and then there's maybe 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, so basically, I did a version of Everything is Remix that was for, uh, for a live audience. So it was just retelling the story of Everything is Remix for people who, who hadn't seen it before, basically. Got it. And you do? Are you doing the same thing now? For this is not a conspiracy theory. Not yeah, I'm not. I'm not quite. De- I still do. I, I have done one, um, but I actually still do. Everything's remix talks. Th- those are mostly what I do lately. And at some point, I'm hoping that will happen. But it's not quite. I'm still at part two. Uh, mm-hmm. Part three will be coming out in the near future of this is not a conspiracy theory. And there's seven parts, and I, and I don't think I'm quite deep enough with it yet to, to really have a, a well-rounded talk. It took until part three of Everything is Remix before I really had like a, like a complete talk. So what, what now does your typical day look like as a freelance independent artist like from start to finish? It's very cyclical. Uh, it's kind of seasonal almost. Like um, for, for my own video work, a, a lot of what I do is my own... Th- is that this is not a conspiracy theory project, which makes you know a moderate uh, amount of money um, through through sales. So that can kind of keep me going when I'm not doing commission work. So when I'm doing that, like I'm either researching, writing, uh, or doing video production. So sometimes I'm getting up and I'm you know I'm reading a lot and I'm doing you know various admin things and and all that stuff. Sometimes I'm I'm writing for a good chunk of the day and then the, again there's always like just admin stuff that, that has to be happening and then when I'm doing video production I'm just d- just doing that like all day long basically uh, and then sometimes I take a break and I have to do a commission uh, and I'll take a month or two and uh, do a video commission and that's just that's more like a conventional 9 to 5 ish sort of thing I get up I you know I, I work on the scripts for it I, I do production, whatever. That that's a little more conventional. But other than that, it's very, it's very cyclical. It's 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 researching, writing, production. Then I go back to the start, and it's researching, writing, production. That that's how my, that's my workflow. So how do you how do you stay um, on top of things? Like how do you stay motivated even when you're doing client work that you're not interested in? Like how do you not procrastinate? Because like we said before, uh, you know, if you don't work, you're not getting paid because you're independent. Yeah. Um, fortunately, I, I like the commission work that I do generally. Um, like the things that, that, that see, that's a good thing about putting out work that you 
are proud of and that you put yourself into is that the, the, what people want from you is usually stuff that you're you're interested in. So generally, the commission stuff, I'm I'm interested in in doing it. I usually like the people that I'm working with. Um, and there's a deadline, which helps. You know, frequently for my own stuff, there, there's not an actual deadline, or it's just a self self-imposed deadline, which is you know not the same thing. Um, so I don't know. I I, I enjoy it, and um, it's how I make my money, and I it's how I make the majority of my money still is with video commission work. So I take it very seriously, and uh, I think that that keeps me going. Like, if I don't make those things happen, then, you know, I'm going to run out of bread. So it's, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to, to stay motivated. Um, well, what about, like, your own personal stuff? Like, like you said, it's self-imposed yeah. deadlines, which is very different. So how do you keep yourself motivated to keep writing and keep working on your own personal projects that you don't even know if it's going to, like, sure. take off or not? Yeah, I think you just I think you have to be like really interested in it and interested in seeing where it's going, how it's going to work out. Um, like I think you have to be making your own dream work, you know. Like like you have to be making something that you want to see live and breathe in the world, you know. Like and if you don't do it, then it's it's not going to get done. Um, so I think that's the main source of my motivation is that I, I want to see this thing. I, I want to see this thing get out there. And I have a pretty good work ethic, you know, like I'm pretty good at, um, I'm reasonably obsessive. I, I think that helps, you know, like I, I stick to it. Once I'm into it, I, I stick with something. Um, so fortunately, I have a pretty good, like, keep going Sort of, sort of attitude, and I'm, I'm personally kind of an, an endurance guy. Like, I don't necessarily work really. I'm not really quick. I'm slow, actually. Um, but I just keep going. You know, I manage to just, just keep going. Um. So, do you ever like have multiple ideas or projects going on at once? I mean, you have everything's a remix, and this is not a conspiracy theory. So, how do you, how do you decide what you want to work on if you're passionate about multiple things? Mm -hmm. It's hard. Yeah, I mean, it's easiest to just stay on one thing when you can. For me, especially because it takes up so much brain space to work on these things. Because fre frequently, I'm researching them and writing them and doing the video production. So it's just a lot to keep in your brain. So um, it's best when possible to just stay on the one thing. I try to do that when I can, and then I try to, and then I'll, I'll make a clean break often when I have to do um, video commission work. Like I'll just simply stop. Um, the conspiracy theory series, and I'll switch over, and, and I'll probably keep pecking away at it, like doing some some research or some writing, or just you know little little things here and there. Um, but it, you know, the majority of my day is about the is about the commission work at that point. So I I tend to, to stick to one thing, um, and then the, the, there's also ad admin stuff that it, it, that is just going on all the time that that's sort of my busy work like when I don't want to be doing uh, when I can't do creative work um, and when I just want to stay busy you know that there's always administration stuff to get done awesome a lot of administrative stuff can you give an example yeah. of like um, the typical administrative things that you have to be working on there's your social um, your social sites you know your Twitter your Facebook your your Tumblr, whatever, whatever, whatever you're doing, um, you know, you have to keep those up. There's your website, keeping your website, uh, you know, posting to the blog, uh, updating it, fixing things that aren't working. Um, I'm shipping merchandise now. I'm selling posters, so I have to, you know, sometimes pack and ship and and get those things out. And then there's commission work. So there's like doing conversations, getting things set up and rolling. There's, you know, getting invoices out and making sure that the, you know, the check is in the mail and all that stuff. So, and then there's publicizing the series, like just, you know, trying to, you know, keep, you know, uh, keep putting word out, uh, just let people know, know what I'm up to, and keep exploring, you know, keep finding new places, new, new realms that, that might be interested in what I'm up to. Uh, but basically, there's a ton of it. There's just, there's just a lot of, of work in that realm. People don't think about it much, but there's a lot of stuff that you... There's a lot of, like, doing laundry stuff that you you got to do. On top of doing your actual laundry. Yes, Which exactly. Then there's real. Then there's physical laundry, yes. Right, there's real life, like cooking and cleaning yes. and <laughs> yes, showers that and all too. that stuff. Um, yeah, because yeah, you're, you're all by yourself. Like, you don't have anyone... Like, 
Is it a hundred percent you, or do you have like a? No, it's not. Sure. Well, it's me and yeah, it, it's me and my wife now. Uh, so my wife helps with a lot of with whatever she can. She helps with the site a lot. She helps a lot with the the business end of things a lot. She helps with the music of the video series. Um, so she helps out, you know, on like she she works kind of part time on it. I would say. And then there's a lot of fans that help out with the video production. Like there's people who just like what I'm doing and they want to help out with, um, you know, animating a sequence or, or contributing a little music to it or, or shooting some video or whatever. So there's, there's a lot of people that, that chip in. It is still the vast majority of the labor is, is still me because I'm working on it all the time, whereas other people just, you know, uh, tend to just, you know, do a, a single little piece for me. Uh, but it helps a lot. It, it it really adds up. So there's a, a fair amount of other bodies that that help with it at this point. Because at some point you're going to reach a point where, you know, if, if you want to keep getting better with what you're doing, like you're you're going to need some help. Like you're going to hit your head on the ceiling of of your own abilities. There's only so much you can do. So uh, it helps a lot. Like the, the, there were sequences in the last video, in part two of the the conspiracy theory series, that you know I couldn't have done on my own. Like I needed I needed a, a, a specialist to come in and, and do certain things, just because I can't I can't know that much about After Effects or or whatever. You know, like I can't be that good at it. I can only be decent. You know, I'm never going to be great at it because I just don't have the time to to right. spend with it. So yeah, a lot, lot of bodies helping out at this point. Awesome. Um, I just want to take the time to remind everyone that you can go ahead and ask Kirby any questions that you want, and the, there's a little Q&A app that's questions right on the side there, so go ahead and ask. All the questions so far that have come in are great, and we're going through them right now. Um, a little bit ago, you asked about, or you told us that you work on you know, Facebook and Twitter and getting yourself up there, updating blogs. A lot of our animators and a lot of our artists um, are currently on Tumblr, and they use Tumblr a lot. Would mm -hmm. you recommend like promoting yourself on Tumblr, sticking with it, or is it like is it really not going to go anywhere? Honestly, I, I don't have a good answer to that. I don't know a lot about it. I don't really use it personally. I think it's important to like if you're into that culture and you understand it and you enjoy it, you should be there. Like if you're into Tumblr, if you like it, if you get the sorts of things that work on Tumblr, then you should definitely do it. If you don't and you're too old like me to, to get Tumblr, then I, I think it, it's not so important. So I think like stick to, you only have so many resources, you only have so much time. So don't be on platforms that you don't give a shit about. So, you know, do the ones that you're interested in. Like you could get away with just doing Twitter nowadays, I think, if you wanted to. Like I don't think that would really hold you back. Um, so I, I think it's it, it can be a little overrated, I think. Like, are you on this platform or that platform? Are you on Instagram? Are you on Pinterest? Are you on whatever? Like, I, I don't think it's that big a deal. What, what's a big deal is putting out good work, which is really time-consuming and hard. It's not as easy as just setting up an account on, on whatever. So the work is, is more important than, than the platforms, I think. I, I agree with Kirby, and as someone who is a community manager in the network, I just want to let you guys know that as an independent artist, Bandwidth is super important, so it's awesome if you're on all these social media sites and you're giving your fans all these options, but you really, like Kirby said, you need to pick which one that, uh, for lack of a better word, gives you the most bang for your buck, and if your audience is on Tumblr, and if you're always on Tumblr, then go ahead and use it, but if your audience, like, you're really not having any traction on Tumblr and you're posting every day and you're tagging and you're doing everything correctly and it's just not going anywhere. You really need to like take stock and realize like this is taking up a lot of my time when like Kirby said, I could be making awesome content instead of posting to Tumblr where it's like a ghost town. So it, it really depends on your audience and your individual interests as well. Especially for like all the You probably know more than me, actually. It's a, no, it's okay. I mean, what you said, the thing is, I, I've i studied this stuff, and I mean, yeah. it's part of my job to tell people, but you actually lived it, so you're doing yes. it, which is a big yes. difference. Right. Um, so, uh, this question from Sean asks, how can others take um, steps to be able to do what you have achieved as an independent artist? So, like, they're all young, maybe fresh out of college, and they have all these ideas. What, what are the, like, first steps that you recommend in order to becoming an independent? I think that there's no, there's no set, there's no formula, uh, of course, but I think the most important things are to be brave, 
be brave with with putting things out there. It's it's scary putting things out there. People are going to shit on it, especially when you're starting out. Um, you're going to hear all sorts of really awful things. People are going to say really bad things about you and about what you're doing. Um, so you have to be brave and, and be strong to put things out there. Um, be brave, be persistent, like keep doing it if you really believe. Uh, don't be bullheaded, like if something is just clearly not working, don't just, you know, um, I forget what the, what the, what the line is, but, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results or something oh, like yeah. that. No, know, that's it. That's exactly yeah, it. Yeah. So don't just keep, like, if you're trying to, I, I think, you know, we're all trying to please people to, to some extent with what we're doing, um, but try to balance that with your own interests. So be brave, be persistent, and be engaged, be interested, like, as Joseph Campbell said, you know, like, follow your bliss, like, what you're into, like, follow that, go with it. Like, see where it goes. Because if you're doing it just because you think people are going to like it, I think people are going to smell that coming off you. Like, it, it smells like desperation, and nobody's going to nobody's gonna like it. And you're, you're going to start not liking yourself, I, I think, for, for doing stuff like that. So those are just sort of, the, the, there are no, there is no formula, there are no steps, but those things are all, are all absolutely mandatory, and they're difficult, and... They take a long time to, to, to get anywhere with. So be brave, be persistent, and be engaged. That's the easiest one, to be engaged. Just be honest with yourself about, like, am, do I, is this something I really want to put out there? Do I, you know, is this something I really want to pursue? Would I watch this? That's a hard place to get to, 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 to be making things that you actually would like to see. Uh, but at least be heading towards that, you know, like especially when you're young, you, you aren't, ne you're not necessarily doing great work, you know, like you're not, you, you're, you're still raw, you're still young, you're still green, and you're not necessarily doing the kind of work that you aspire to do, but at least be on the path, at least be heading towards that. Right. Well said. Thanks. There, I was, rambling, but... Pardon? A little rambling, but not too bad. No, that's, I mean, that's Brave, persistent, point. engaged. Yeah, and, recap. you know, I'll throw in consistent, too, especially yeah. um, a lot of the people in our network are on YouTube, and YouTube is, like, hugely favors people who are consistent, consistent right. uploading, consistent branding, because they're subscribing for a particular thing. Um, See, I actually don't do that. I am not consistent, actually. I am consistent in my method. I keep working. I, 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 like, I think you have to follow whatever you're like. Like, I'm not a high-volume person. I don't put out a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think for the people that follow me, they they know they know that I'm not going to waste their time when they come watch something by me, and they know that I mean it and I went for it. Like I put real time into it, and it's not just a dude you know blabbing in front of a video camera or whatever. Like I I really put, put some effort into it. So I'm actually not consistent. I actually don't really have that box ticked in that regard. Personally, I do. Like I I keep working. I have a good, I have a good work ethic and all that but I'm not good at putting stuff out very consistently. Well, I mean, and it just goes to show you that it, it's... You don't have to you, do everything. Yeah, and once you yeah. find that niche and you find something that works, then then run with it. it. There's, like you said, there's no formula. Like, we might, at Channel Federal Network, we might say, like, oh, upload twice a week and do this and do that. But, but everything we say, it's always best practices. It's what's going to give you the best chance, but that doesn't mean it's the only way to do things. Yeah, um, and sometimes it's best to, like, go where... Um, where it's less crowded, like uh, like don't do what everybody else is doing. Like like I think by being a slow creator, that that actually that makes my work different. That makes me uh, that gives me an, an appeal that that you can't have if you're a fast creator. Like you can't do the things that I, I do quickly. It's just not possible. Right. So you know. It, you know, you can have your own unique appeal by following, you know, uh, your interests and, and what you're good at. Like, I'm just not a high, I, I've learned over the years that I'm just not a high volume person. Like, it's not, it's not even what I'm interested in other people's work. Like, when something looks like it took a few days to do, I'm, I'm generally not that interested in seeing it or hearing it or whatever. Like, I want things that are, are labored over. That, that's personally what I'm, what I'm into, and it's what I try to do in my own work. Right. And that's a good thing too. So, are you are you an avid um, like? Do you yourself watch a lot of content in the field that you're in? So yeah. you're like, is that what you say when you say research? 
No, yeah. when I say research, I'm reading. Actually, I'm I'm reading. Uh, I'm researching the the topics in the videos. Um, so that's mostly what what I what I mean. I'm I'm figuring out the actual content. It, it's the same thing an academic would do. Like it's it's reading a buttload of books and keeping notes and and sorting them and and all that stuff. But there is also research researches in just seeing what's going on and seeing what techniques are happening and seeing what kind of work is getting done, and um, you know getting inspiration from what's going on in the world and and staying staying engaged with with what people are into and, and what's working. Because I have to leave the production world a lot to go do research and go do writing, um, you know, I have to, like, reconnect with that sometimes. You know, I have to go out there and just, you know, watch a lot of things and, like, see what's happening now. Because um, otherwise I've just, you know, had my book, had in the book for, for a few months or, or whatever. So it, it's definitely part of it, um, uh, you know, consuming media, seeing what's going on, seeing what you like from, from what other people are doing. What about staying up to date on your programs? Because as a video editor, I maybe use Premiere, Final Cut, or something mm -hmm. like that. Do you go and like take tutorials or classes to stay up to date? Because they're always being updated. Yeah, I don't think that's a big deal personally. I wouldn't be putting a lot of time towards that if I was uh, uh, a young creator. Um, it certainly has its part. Like, like you want to, you need to have a tool set. You know, you you need to have fundamentals. So I definitely think there's a place for you definitely want to you like you want to check out lynda.com uh, if you're doing video work you, you want to check out um, I think it's called Groove 3 if you're if you're a musician um, you probably haven't heard that one a lot of people haven't but yeah it's like a like a Linda for for people who are using Logic or, or Ableton Live or, or whatever um, you know you want to be just checking out YouTube tutorials and and staying up to up to speed with uh, you want to get up to speed with, with the with the programs you want to get fluent um, but I think what you what's coming out of you is a lot more important than that like what kind of results are you getting and if you can get the if, if you can be telling interesting stories and getting the effects that you want without doing that and just by pursuing your own by having your own weird techniques that you use just keep using them and updating programs and what programs you use and all that stuff I think that's I, I think that's mostly a waste of time like I happen to use Premiere I could use Final Cut Pro I, or Final Cut X I, I think it would be fine probably or, or Avid or whatever I don't think it would matter that much um, you know the tools don't matter that much it doesn't matter what paintbrush you're using really I, I don't think um, you know what matters is to keep working and, and keep trying to get better like people tend to why I think often the interest in, in programs and stuff it's sort of because people want shortcuts and I get that like like I and there's a place for shortcuts I'm not saying people shouldn't try to try to find some shortcuts because they're they're good to have but the real daunting work is is just rolling up your sleeves and, and doing it and, and not procrastinating and actually trying to make something and, and be happy with results. Like that's the really scary hard part and your programs aren't really going to do a lot for you there. Like you have to just do it. You have to get in there and, and, and do it. So I think programs can, can be a distraction and I would be wary of it myself. So you would, you would say overall um, become a master of your art rather than the tool. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Yeah, I think that's a fair, fair restatement. Yeah. So how about this question from who, I guess? Um, so Steve Pressfield, if you know who he is, talks about breaking through boxes. I don't. Who's Steve Pressfield? I don't know. I was hoping you would know. Oh, okay. I, I was, <laughs> you I bullshitting was all of us. Uh, um, he asks, or he talks about breaking through blocks that keep artists from reaching their... Oh, I think I know who that is. Oh, yeah? Just let um, me check real quick. I think he may have written... No, let, let me Google it before I before I stick my foot in my mouth. Uh, and, um, the awesome Steve part of being online. The, the War of Art, maybe? Did he write? I don't know. The War of Art. Know. Yeah, he wrote. I, yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah. The War Good of job, Art. Kirby. Yeah, yeah. So he's sort of a, an anti-procrastination guy. He's a, like, work ethic, like... Just, you know, it, it, it sucks, but do it kind of guy. Sorry, back to the question. No, it's okay. Um, they ask, like, what was your personal, like, your biggest block that you had to work through in order to keep going personally, not just through video commissions, but for your own personal creative work? I think staying on track is the hardest thing for me. Um, staying on track and finishing things and putting them out was a big deal for me. Like, I would... 
by the time I for a long time I didn't really like anything that I was doing for for like there are little parts of things that I I would like but for the most part I think when you're starting out you're not really going to be that crazy about what you're doing probably um for for most people maybe maybe in animation it's different maybe you can find your voice earlier in, in animation I'm not sure um, there's certainly going to be some point when you start and you're going to suck you're you know you're not going to be good because you're just starting out and everybody sucks when when you start out. So for me, by the time I finished something, I'd kind of already be over it. Like, oh, I'm sick of this. Like, what's the point of even putting it out? You know, I did the best I could, but, eh, you know, it's okay. It's fine. Um, so I think it's important to, you know, as Steve Jobs would say, to ship, to, you know, great artists ship, you know, put it out there. Even if you don't like it that much, put it out there, you know. You, you, you cared about it in the time that you were doing it. So put it out there and, and let people let people be the judge and don't be attached to it, you know, if they like it, if they don't like it. Uh, whatever you know, it's not you. It's it's just work that you work that you did. So, just putting stuff out was was a big deal for me because for for a long time I didn't didn't like a lot of what I was doing all that much. And staying on track, like I, I think staying on track also was hard for me because I would change so much in the process of making things. I'd get so much better. Like if I spent, I'll, I'll take a big figure. If I, I spent two months working on something when I was starting out, at the end of that, the two months, I, I'd grown so much since when I started it that, like, you, you, like, it's, like, do I even want to finish this anymore? You know, like, my whole, you know, my whole way of doing things has changed so much that, like, it's hard to even finish this because I don't even get why I started it, really. You can get confused about what you're doing when you're, when you're growing really rapidly. So that was a big deal for me. And that was a challenge that I, I think I did a pretty good job I, I strive to do a good job of addressing by doing really large things that are multiple parts and like you really have to have your shit together like you really gotta know okay like like I can tell this story this new one is 80 minutes long like I gotta know you know I'm gonna stick with this for for 80 minutes and there's still plenty of room to, to grow and, and change and experiment within that framework but I, I, I have a framework that I have figured out so that was a challenge for me and that took I was in my late 30s, I think, before I before I got decent at that. So these things are a long haul, you know. That this is the persistence part, you know. Like I was just a hired gun doing whatever until my my late 30s. I think I was 37 or something when I when I quit my job. Um, so you know, it takes a long time. It takes uh, a, a lot of years. There have to be a lot of years under your belt before you have before you can potentially be doing your own thing. Right, dedication. Unless you get lucky. That too, yeah. unless you get it. And we tend to hear about that. Video. That's the unfortunate thing. We tend to hear about the lucky ones. You know, they tend to be the stories that we get told about. But I think much more common is is something like me, where you you work for a really long time, and then eventually you can make the break, and you just you know, income wise, you sort of stay where you were, but you you know, you're doing your own thing, and it's 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 enjoyable in a, and fulfilling well, in a way fulfilling. that a, a yeah. job can be. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Cool. So how about this question, which I really like. Do you think we live in a throwaway society with creative content, and how can we make content that we are proud of that will stay relevant over time? Hmm, that is a very good question. I, I think absolutely we live in a throwaway society with creative content. Um, because people are impatient. You know, we're, we're a fairly impatient culture at this point, so I think the responsibility is lies with us to a great degree, but it's also because platforms, you know, want, to, you know, they, they want to keep you engaged. They want you watching, you know, stuff, 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 stuff. Um, you know, they want to keep your plateful. They want to keep you coming back. So, they, you know, they load it on with just as much stuff as they can possibly get on there. So, yeah, we're absolutely in a, in a throwaway culture at the moment, but who knows where we will be uh, in the future. But that happens to be what's happening right now for the most part. And for me, I, I think I, uh, again, like not to toot my own horn, but I think I'm pretty good at this. Like I think I do things where I'm considering it to be something that's going to be around like after um, after it's over, after I'm not working on it anymore, after, you know, there aren't necessarily people emailing all the time and, the, you know, the, the little bit of, of fame, the 15 minutes of fame is over, it's still out there, you know, living a life and there's still new people discovering it. 
and I want it to be, I want to still be proud of it, you know, and that doesn't mean necessarily thinking that I did everything right or thinking that it's the greatest thing in the world, it just means that I meant it, you know, and I went for it, and I did the best I could with it, so I think that's the name of the game, is like, do the best you can, realize that it can live for a while, if you get lucky, <coughs> like, it can, it can hang around, uh, even after the project is over, or you die a tragic death, like, it's still out there, it's still out there living on, and, and it can mean something to somebody, so, remember that these things continue living for who knows how long, who knows how long people will, will be looking at browsing around YouTube and finding old animation videos, and, and, Maybe even though yours wasn't, you know, it didn't connect with people at the time, maybe maybe later it will. So do the best you can with these things and, and try to make them count. And I mean, to touch on the throwaway um, society thing, I mean, YouTube itself as a platform is starting to favor ch channels that are uploading content on, like, a daily basis. This really? Is why, yeah, this is why people like PewDiePie, I don't know if you know who he is. I do, yeah. Um, he, he, that's why he does so well, because he uploads, like, what? four videos a day or something oh crazy God, like that. Really? Insane. Like, he yeah. he is the YouTube algorithm star child channel, and that's how he got right. so big. And it's... and I it's, think there's... I tend to think... That, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, finish what you were going to say. I was just going to say, it's really hard and really sad for animators, because, like, Channel and Frederator, we're uh, animators, too. We're in, we're in the boat, the same with everybody else here in the network, and it's, like, do you want us to make stick figure flip books, YouTube, yeah. and upload those? Like... Yeah. It's 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 a struggle, and it's hard for us even as like a big company to keep on top of posting content that we're proud of, and also serving you know making sure that we get bread on the table and that my salary is paid. So it's it's yep. it's really difficult, and even social media networks like Twitter and then Snapchat. Like Snapchat, you don't even get to keep anything; you just mm -hmm. it just gets deleted. So talk about throwaway content. Like Snapchat yep. is huge with, I think like thirteen year olds. Right. It's, so yeah, doing? I mean, I, I think that favors basically that game favors video bloggers, you know, like people who can sit in their front of their front of their camera and and talk, and some people can do that well and, and be entertaining. But I did, I personally don't find pretty much any of it to be interesting. I don't care who it is, like I, I, I don't, I don't want to hear anybody just riff for for ninety minutes or whatever, you know, like or twenty minutes or whatever. I, I just don't think that kind of content is all that interesting generally. I like written things, you know, things that have been edited and gone over and, and produced, uh, critiqued and yeah, yeah. And animation is like, uh, you know, the, if it's going to be good, it's going to take you some amount of time to to do it. You're not going to spit it out in a, in a day or whatever. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately that game favors the video bloggers, but I you know, that's where we are right now. Who knows where we will be because what works Today doesn't necessarily work tomorrow. These things change, you know, like people get sick of that shit and they, they want something else and then, hey, there's these other people who've been, you know, there, there's this subculture of animators and they, you know, they put some effort into their stuff and, and uh, you know, their stuff's a lot more concise and a lot better written and, and looks better and is better produced and all that. Um, you know, then it can become that era. Who knows? Um, I think you have to, you know, whatever you're passionate about, you know, you you got to follow that. Animation is not a quick turnaround, not a quick turnaround format. Um, so we have time for one more question. Can you see yeah. the questions on the side? Yes. I was going to have you pick whichever one you wanted to answer. Oh, gosh, what a pressure. Yeah. You have three. We answered most of them. I can answer one really, really quickly. Job. I okay. can answer I can, how, how important do you think a college degree is in mm -hmm. the industry? It's not. <laughs> I don't hate it. That that's my that's my quick quick answer to that. What what's important, you know, is to make work, to to do work and, and put it out there. Your portfolio. Uh, yeah, j just start making stuff. Like that's the hard part. That's the thing that people don't that are, that people are afraid of. That people don't want to do. Like do that. Uh, I, I I can probably answer both of them. Go for it. Okay. So how do you separate your work life from your normal life? Sorry. Um, how do you separate your work life from your normal life um, while working for yourself? It could be tempting to stay and sleep in late uh, or stay out or, or sit on a Saturday night working or updating social media. Um, be a workaholic, <laughs> I think. Like, your work has to be fun. You have to, your work has to be fun. You have to, like, really enjoy it. It has to be more fun than, than doing these other things. If you really like it, 
then it's more fulfilling for you than than doing these other things. So that's my that's my quick answer to that. I, I enjoy like work is fun. Work is fun for me. I really like it. With industry being so competitive, what are three things one can do to make themselves stand out from the rest of the job hopefuls? I don't know much about seeking jobs. Um, and it's I don't know. It's from like word of mouth, right? And by putting your work out yeah. there, they come to you. Yeah, yeah. Put out good work that you are proud of. And you don't get that. That's all you can do. All you can do is is follow your interests and put things out there that you are proud of and that you worked hard on and pay attention to what comes back you know pay attention to what the feedback is like are people interested in this because I think you know you do have to serve you have to serve an audience there is a measure of, of that to it for sure that's important but it is important to to be brave and, and put it out there as your voice and you're not trying to just be popular with what you're doing or, or whatever so so be honest with, with, with yourself about what is interesting to you and put it out there and, and see what happens Awesome. So we have like, we'll just say two, one minute left. Is there any other like parting words of wisdom you have for our Gosh. animators and creators? I mean, I mean, no pressure, but yeah. is there any way you'd like to like sum it all up or just anything? Well, I mean, I think to, to, yeah, to sum it up, I, I think follow your bliss is the big thing, is to, to be interested in what you are doing to above all be serving yourself, to be your own audience, to be making the sort of thing that you wish was was out there. Um, I especially think of it as like I'm doing things that I wish when I was uh, a younger person, I wish I could have found things like the things that I'm making now. Like they would have changed my world and, and rocked my mind if, if I could have found this sort of stuff that I'm that I'm managing to do now. Not that hard. I was, you know, a teenager or whatever, but uh, you know, create the work that you would like to to see get made, and don't don't try to please everybody. Everybody with with what you're doing, follow your yourself, but at the same time, follow your own interests. But at the same time, you know, uh, improve improve constantly with what you're doing, and and don't you know don't be indulgent. Don't embrace the the parts of you that are obviously destructive. Embrace the best of you. Make the best of the things that are best in you. And improve the things that are that are lacking. Well said, Kirby. Um, I want to really quickly thank you so much for hopping on with us and showing us that yes, it can be done. You can be an independent artist and support yourself. You do need some help along the way, but um, you totally can do it. So again, for those of you interested in watching what Kirby does, we have the re everything is a remix, and as well as this is not a conspiracy. And again, you can see it on YouTube and Vimeo, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything, yeah, that's right. And if you go to this is not a conspiracy theory .com, you can see the first episode of, of the new series for free. Totally go check it out, see what he's been working on. Um, if you have any other questions, like dire questions that we didn't get to, I think we got to all of them, you can email me directly at jenniferfederator.com and I can forward them over to Kirby for you guys. Or if you have any suggestions for any types of live streams that you'd like to see in the community in the future, you can also let me know and I will do my best to get people on board for you. Um, so again, I want to say thank you, Kirby. I hope you have an amazing rest of your week. And I will send you over the link to share this um, live stream with anybody if you'd like. Cool. Perfect. All right. So, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.